Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Well, good morning, everyone. I'll say it one more time. Good morning. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, today as we continue our series in Romans, continue meaning we just began last week, but today we'll be examining uh, further on in chapter 1, verses 8 through 15. So I invite you to open your Bibles to that passage, Romans 1. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 15. Before we delve into it, let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, your servant David, whom you called a man after your own heart, prayed in Psalm 19 that the words of his mouth and thoughts of his heart might be acceptable to you. And with that in mind, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and that the thoughts of our hearts would also be pleasing to you as we examine this passage in Romans 1. And in so doing, we pray that you will teach us by your spirit from your word so we can apply it to our daily lives and be more conformed to the image of your Son. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, as we saw in our introduction to Romans last week, the book of Romans is largely considered the greatest theological work of the Apostle Paul. It's a well-developed presentation of grace-filled, exalting theology, God-exalting theology, and it's sometimes been called the constitution of Christianity. The book of Romans, with its deep theological truths, has probably made more impact on Christian history than any other book. And as a formal treatise within a personal letter to people he had never personally met, Romans is a more formal and less personal book than most of all, uh, Paul's other epistles. Yet, as we'll see from the very personal way that Paul expressed himself to his readers in today's text, ministry flows from one's heart not just one's head. And that was the secret of Paul's success. He had a heart for people. Paul never forgot that Christ came to save people. Romans 1, 8 through 15 is Paul's very personal statement about his own deep interest in the first century believers in Rome. It's worth noting why Paul felt it necessary to begin his epistle in such an intimate manner. Paul had never been to Rome at the time he wrote this letter. And that's quite atypical for Paul because he usually visited a city like Thessalonica or Corinth. And then he left to continue his travels and later wrote a letter back to the believers in that city, such as he did in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and 1st and 2nd Corinthians. But that's not what Paul is doing here in the book of Romans. Since Paul had never been to Rome, he felt a special obligation to introduce himself to the Roman believers. After all, how else would they know him? How could they decide whether or not to trust this person named Paul? To say it another way, how do you convince people that you really care about them when you've never met them face to face? So Paul writes about his deep feelings for the Roman Christians in order to win their confidence and help them know how much he cared for them. In Romans 1, 8 through 15, we see Paul's heart unveiled. Before he jumps into heavy, heavy theology, he writes a few lines sharing his own personal concern for the believers in Rome. And in so doing, we learn not only what Paul's heart was like, but also the secret of effective Christian ministry. What kind of heart did Paul have? Well, these verses provide, I believe, five answers. First of all, he had a grateful heart as indicated in verse 8. Paul begins, if you notice, with a compliment. The very first words that are out of his mouth are positive words of affirmation. The text says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because the news of your faith is being reported in all the world. Now, obviously, Paul is using hyperbole here, a figure of speech and employing exaggeration with a point of emphasis. But he means that their faith has echoed throughout the Roman Empire. This use of hyperbole is 
uh, similar to that used in Luke 2 verse 1, which says that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered or taxed, meaning that the inhabited world, that is, the Roman Empire. Paul's opening statement here in verse 8 must have been very uplifting to his readers. No doubt the Romans were very encouraged when, they, uh, when he said that they had heard about their faith. Maybe they hadn't heard about him, but he had heard about them. This leaves no doubt that Paul's audience were genuine believers. As we saw last week, the Roman church was not fathered or founded by any apostle, and yet the assemblies that God himself had gathered from all quarters into the world's capital had a faith in Christ, which was being reported throughout the entire Roman Empire. Reported, too, much differently than it is today. Reported, for example, without any telegraph, any newspaper, any radio, no TV, no internet, which meant no email, or no phones, no uh, text messaging. What a testimony these Roman believers had. What kind of testimony do we have in our community? What testimony do we have, for example, at our job, or with our friends, or with our family? The Roman believers had a testimony that was published abroad. It was a testimony so powerful that it echoed throughout Rome. God saw to it that is a real work of the, his Holy Spirit was published abroad, as it also was with the Thessalonians, as Paul said to them in 1 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. You became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, for the word of the Lord rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith in God has gone out. So Paul begins here in Romans 1, 8 by expressing his heartfelt gratitude for the church at Rome. When he says, your faith is being reported all over the world, he's exaggerating to a certain extent, but he's doing it for a reason. You know, he could have said people are talking about your faith throughout various communities, but there are still many people who don't know who you are. And that may have been technically true, but what good would it have done? So Paul says, everywhere I go, they're talking about the committed Christians in Rome. No wonder the Romans were ready to hear his message. Well, a second key to effective Christian ministry is a praying heart. Notice what Paul writes in verses 9 and 10. God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in telling the good news about his son, that I constantly mention you, always asking my prayers that if it is somehow in God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. You see, Paul's interest in the Romans went beyond merely rejoicing in their faith. That interest found significant expression in his own prayer life. You know, it takes real faith to pray to an unseen God who uh, over issues that we don't many times see answers to immediately as we'd like to. It takes even more faith to pray when we don't even know those who we're praying for. Well, Paul prayed for this church, for people whom he had never even met. And we're told in James 5.16 that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know, many times we don't see, we don't see its powerful effect. But our prayer is still doing a tremendous work. And that's what faith is all about. Real faith deals with things that are not seen. As we're told in Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the confidence of what we hope for and assurance about we, what we do not see. Well, Paul claimed to pray for these Romans he had never met constantly, meaning frequently, but, but not necessarily without stopping. The Greek word that Paul used here is adialeptos, or adialeptos, let's say. It's the same word that he used in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, where he exhorts Christians to pray without ceasing. And this same Greek expression was used to describe a hacking cough, coughing without ceasing. Some of you know what that's like. You know, just as a ha hacking cough stays with a person throughout the day, Paul's prayerful concern for the Roman believers was something that was always with him. These saints were constantly in his thoughts and prayers, and he called God to be witness of his, this fact. You know, God knew what kind of prayer life Paul had. 
You know, other people cannot witness our prayer life. Only God can. Paul was, wasn't just pretending to be a man of prayer. Paul knew that his prayer life was genuine, and he knew that God knew. After all, those prayers were made to him. But this prayer activity, Paul suggests, was part of his service to God, whom he served. As he says, you notice, with my spirit in telling the good news about his son. Now, since Paul knew the value of intercession with respect to prayer, he understood that the gospel or the good news about Jesus could be truly served not only with his lips, but also with his spirit through that medium of prayer. By the way, his reference to serving, as he says, with my spirit in this way means with my whole heart. And imagine how that must have made the Romans feel. They must have been tremendously honored that, to know that the Apostle Paul had continually prayed for them with his whole heart, even though he had never met them. You know, to be truthful, I'd rather have someone say, I'm praying for you, rather than I love you. Because if they're really praying for me, I, I really know that they love me. If you pray from one, for someone regularly, you will begin to love them. You cannot love without praying or pray without loving. You see that one leads to the other. Well, not only did Paul mention the Roman Christians constantly before God, but as if you notice, verse 10 indicates he was also regularly requesting in his prayers the opportunity to come and visit them in Rome. If you look ahead to verse 13, notice that this had not been possible up to now, and Paul realized that the success of any effort he made to come depended on God's will. Paul had learned through many experiences that the sovereign hand of the Lord determined where he went and when. Verse 13, along with Acts 24, 27, suggests that Paul may have waited more than two years before this prayer was answered, which is, encourages us as well to be perseverant in our prayers. One obstacle that, Paul, or that may have prevented Paul from reaching Rome previously was the imperial edict of Emperor Claudius in AD 49, which called for the expelling Jews from Rome. And that's mentioned in Acts 18.2. Well, the third key to effective Christian ministry is a longing heart, indicated in verses 11 through 13. Paul continues, For I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I often intended to come to you and was prevented until now so that I might have a fruitful ministry among you just as I have had among the rest of the Gentiles. The late 19th and early 20th century Scottish biblical scholar J.B. Moffat translates I long to see you in verse 11 as I am homesick to see you. Homesick? <laughs> had Paul ever been to Rome? No. How could he be homesick for a place he had never visited? And the answer is that he prayed for them so much and thought about them so much that he felt as if he had already known them. You see, Rome didn't seem like a foreign country to Paul. It seemed like home to him. And the reason Paul wanted to see the Roman Christians minister to them in person was so that he might be more uh, able to fully establish them in their walk with Christ. And this is seen in three parallel purpose statements he made, if you notice, in verses 11 through 13. One was so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, in verse 11, and then that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, in verse 12. And thirdly, so that I may have a fruitful ministry among you, in verse 13. Uh, now, the literal Greek phrase spiritual gift here, charisma pneumaticon, in verse 11, does not refer to the type of gifts that are imparted to the church that we often think of. Paul later spoke of those in chapter 12, verse 6, where he says, according to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware and then in chapter 14, verse 1, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. And if you notice, when Paul speaks of gifts imparted to the church, he always uses it in the plural form grammatically. Elsewhere, when a special ministerial gift appears in the singular form, the combination of spiritual 
and gifts does not occur. For example, in 1 Timothy 4, 1, don't neglect the gift that is in you. And 2 Timothy 1, 6, rekindle the gift of God that is in you. Thus, the mutual encouragement prompted by each other's faith in verse 12 indicates that spiritual benefits, not the church's gifts, are in view. Paul uses the Greek word charisma, translated gift here then, in a non-technical sense. Paul's doctrine about spiritual gifts is that was, was that each Christian already had one. Romans 12, 6, he wrote, Having then gifts differently according to the grace that is given to each, each, each of us, let us use them. And 1 Corinthians 12, 7, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Now, there's no evidence that Paul believed a Christian then could change his or her gift to add one that he or she did not previously have. If you notice 1 Corinthians 12, 11, he also wrote, but one and the same spirit, that is Holy Spirit, works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 18 and 19, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? Thus, when Paul mentions his desire to impart to you some spiritual gift, he doesn't mean that he has all the gifts in a bag and he goes around like an ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical Santa Claus, as it were, doling them out to people wherever he goes. Impart really means share with you. You see, it isn't something that Paul gives to them. Only the Holy Spirit can give spiritual gifts. Paul wants to share with them the gifts that God has given. He wants to minister to them as they are expected also to minister to him with the spiritual gifts that they have. Thus, they will be mutually strengthened by each other's faith. And you see, this adds an entirely new dimension. How do you think that made them feel, these Romans? Paul, the great apostle, said, I'm looking forward to seeing you, not just so that I can give you something, but so that you can also minister to me. You know, that's a ministry of mutual encouragement. It's what happens when we minister to each other. You see, uh, reciprocity is the heart of Christian ministry. We give something to someone else, and they give it back to us. You see, friends, ministry is not just a one-way street. It's a two-way street with blessings and encouragement constantly being shared both ways. And that's how God wants a church to function. The saints ministering to each other, building up each other by their faith and sharing and exercising the gifts that God has given them. Well, how then did God answer Paul's prayer? We saw that in verse 11 that Paul had a great desire to go to Rome. He said, for I long to see you. And also later on in chapter 15, verse 23, he says, I have strongly desired for many years to come to you. You see, friends, many times Rome was included on Paul's travel itinerary, but again and again, Paul was hindered from making his trip, as see in verse 13, where he says, I have often intended to come to you and was prevented until now. And also in Romans 15, 22, I have been prevented many times from coming to you. We've seen one reason Paul wanted to go to Rome, in verses 11 through 13, to minister to them in person so that they could be built up spiritually in Christ. Another reason is suggested by Acts 9.15. In that passage, we're told that where the Lord had spoken in a vision to a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And he said, this man, referring to Saul, also called Paul, is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. Now, Paul knew that God had given them, him then a special ministry to kings, and there was no better place to find a king than in Rome. The, the king, the Caesar, the Roman emperor, lived there. Did God answer Paul's prayer? Did Paul eventually get to Rome? Yes, he did, but he got there in a very unusual way. You know, God does not always answer our prayers the way we think he should. Paul's successful journey, where he said in verse 10, I, if I succeed in coming to you, it, 
It turned out to be one of the most treacherous and dangerous trips across the Mediterranean Sea that you could ever imagine. It's described in detail for us in Acts chapter 27. Now, certainly this trip was not what Paul had expected. Also, Paul came to Rome under very unusual circumstances. He was actually escorted there as a prisoner. Paul's prayer was answered, but in a very unusual way. As the 18th century Anglican hymn writer William Cowper wrote, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Well, the fourth key to effective Christian ministry is an indebted heart. An indebted heart. Notice what Paul writes in verse 14. I am indebted or obligated both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. In the original language, I am indebted, which in the Greek is aphelates amy, speaks of a solemn moral obligation. It means that Paul did what he did because he felt a holy and sacred obligation. You know, Paul felt a moral indebtedness to the Gentiles to preach the gospel to them. He was essentially saying, I'm coming to Rome because I have a deep moral obligation to go there. But in what sense did he mean that? Again, Paul had never been to Rome. He knew very few people in the church. How could he be indebted to them? Well, the answer is, Paul's true indebtedness was to God, who had given him the gospel. Paul stated earlier in verse 5 that he had received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. So it isn't that the Gentiles had some claim on Paul in their own right, but rather that the Lord Jesus Christ had a claim on him because of the grace and apostleship that he had bestowed on Paul. Thus, he was a debtor to every kind of Gentile, to Greeks, or those who were under the influence of Greek culture and language, and, as he says, to barbarians, who were foreigners, who were not under the direct influence of Greek culture. The Greeks were those with earthly wisdom, and the barbarians were those who lacked it. Paul owed the gospel to every member of the human race. You know, at one point in his life, Paul, also called Saul of Tarsus, felt an obligation to persecute every Christian before he was converted on the road to Damascus. But now Paul felt an obligation to preach the gospel to every creature. Well, what kind of obligation or gospel uh, or duty do we have? You know, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 20 through 21, we're told that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. <laughs> You see, those who are recipients of God's good news feel burdened and obligated to pass it on to others. You know, if you were a, a medical researcher and you discovered a cure for cancer, would you keep it a secret? As the saying goes, life is short, death is sure, sin the cause, Christ the cure. So how could Paul ever hope to repay the Almighty God? What could he offer that God would accept? You know, there was nothing that he could give, that he could directly give back to God. But there was one thing that he could do. He could take what God had given him and share it with others. In this sense, Paul was indebted to the people of Rome, even though he had never met them. You know, there are several ways of incurring debt. For example, if we borrow money from someone, then we're obligated to pay the money back. But a second way is to be given money for someone by a third party. You know, someone entrusts us with something to give someone else, we're obligated or in debt to that person to pay them what is owed. It's a matter of what's called stewardship or trusteeship. You know, if the gospel has come to us, and it has, we have no right to keep it to ourselves. We are one to Christ by the gospel, and we are to win others by sharing that gospel with them. If God has shown us mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ, he has placed us in debt as well. Christians say, I pay my honest debts. But do we? 
we have not done so until we have shared what we have received from the Lord with others. You now, people who owe money to others and neglect to pay it back are called thieves. Maybe you thought sharing the gospel was an option for you. But God says it's an obligation for us. God doesn't charge us for salvation, but we have a duty, an obligation, a responsibility to share that gospel with others. Well, the fifth key to effective Christian, Christian ministry is an eager heart, indicated in verse 15. Paul indicates being indebted or obligated both to the wise and the foolish. That was a common way of speaking by Romans and other cultures that were among Paul's readers. To whom he says here in verse 15, I am eager or ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Now especially important in understanding this verse and the book of Romans as a whole was how the word gospel from the Greek word euangelion is used here. If you look at the immediate context, the plural you, the pronoun you, Human appears nine times, each referring to the Roman believers. For example, in, in uh, verse 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, twice. But how can Paul preach the gospel to saints, as they're called in verse 7, whose faith is already being reported in all the world in verse 8? Well, to understand this properly, as I mentioned last week, is essential to realize that in his use of the word gospel here, Paul does not mean simply explaining how to become a Christian. And that's what we often think it means, but that is not what Paul means here because these Romans were already Christians. The word gospel in the book of Romans includes a much broader concept than merely justification. In addition, the gospel also furnishes power through Christ's resurrection for we as believers to victoriously live now by the Spirit and be delivered from God's temporal wrath being brought about or brought about by sin in our lives. The word prothumos, translated eager here in verse 15, is also a strong word that means something like ready, willing, and able. You know, Paul was so eager to come to Rome that he couldn't wait to get there. The New King James Version also adds, so much as is in me, I am ready. You know, Paul is essentially saying with every ounce of intellect, ability, and energy until I'm exhausted. You know, the words of the familiar hymn, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder, composed by hymnist John Milton Black, ring true here. Verses 1 and 2 speak of how... There we go. Verses 1 and 2 speak of how when the last trumpet sounds and Christ returns... We, the saints who follow Jesus, whose names are recorded in the book of life, we will rise from our graves and meet God in his heavenly kingdom. In the meantime, as verse 3 says, let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the role is called up yonder, I'll be there. So little time, so much to do. As we close our time here in Romans 1 this morning, perhaps a little self-evaluation may be in order. Let's ask ourselves, what's the passion of my life? What am I living for? What am I indebted to? What am I really eager to do? Am I still twiddling my thumbs, as it were, and wasting my life on things that really don't matter? I'm getting convicted now. I don't know about you. <laughs> or have I gotten excited, as Paul did, about the most important thing in the world, sharing Jesus Christ with those who don't know him, as well as edifying those who do? Am I truly involved in the ministry of sharing God's love with others? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the example you've given us of Paul's heart for ministry here in Romans 1. Help us as believers to model the way he did in caring for fellow believers within the body of Christ and have a desire like he did to not only proclaim the gospel to those who are spiritually lost, but, but also to encourage each other in our walk with you. Help us, Lord, in this endeavor to have grateful hearts, praying hearts, 
longing hearts, indebted hearts, and eager hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.